Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to this session. I'll be co-moderating this with Shams. Good evening, everybody. Shams, I delight to be with you um, here from this primary healthcare special program, co-moderating with Anshu. And I'm Anshu Banerjee. I'm the director for maternal newborn child adolescent health and aging. And I've noticed during this assembly that that's a little bit too long as a name for a department. <laughs> But uh, um, we would like to welcome you, and particularly, maybe I make a few introductory comments and then Shams, you take over, uh, just to highlight why this is so important for us as a department, why w water and sanitation and hygiene in healthcare facilities is so crucial. And particularly, it's one around um, uh, quality of care. Uh, we do know that uh, we have many uh, health facilities that still don't have running water either or sanitation nor um, maybe even electricity uh, and hygiene uh, in uh, facilities let's say in order to do away with medical waste etc and so from a quality of care perspective for mothers delivering in health facilities for um, theaters that have to run and uh, for providing care for newborns uh, who are small or sick newborn and are in special care units we need to be able to provide uh, good water and uh, sanitation. Secondly, of course, it also applies to the healthcare workers. We want to make sure that healthcare workers have a good working environment, and so it's super important that they actually have access to water and sanitation as well. And um, I'm just going to throw in the issue of energy and solar panels as well, in order to be able to provide services with quality and that they're comfortable and that they feel supported to do so. And um, we're going to look a little bit at lessons learned, progress. Uh, we just had a, a whole session around maternal or women, children and adolescents at the World Health Assembly. We closed the session yesterday afternoon and there was a call for a resolution next year. And I think it's an opportunity for us to see together with member states whether we would like to put some kind of target around washing facilities in the resolution next year. So I, a bit of hope, I think, in order to get everyone on board, uh, get commitments from member states uh, over the year in order to develop that as part of the resolution. And then it will allow us to monitor implementation and uh, support countries to achieving those targets. Shams, over to you. Thank you, Anshu. Uh, uh, really great to be here and thinking about it from the primary healthcare lens. It's really important for us to ensure that we focus on water sanitation and hygiene and the wider physical infrastructure issues associated with primary healthcare. It's not new, but primary healthcare, the values focusing in on social justice, focusing in on the human rights, these are, these are actually attributes and rights that uh, span various aspects of our health and water sanitation and hygiene is critical to that. Um, and of course, um, many of you will be familiar with the primary healthcare operational framework. One of those pieces within the framework is physical infrastructure, critical to, for us to consider that. Um, at, at all points of planning, and as Anshu has highlighted, all the way from the global right to the local. Um, and then the final point related to synergies, of course, everything that we do within the primary healthcare approach has to include various technical areas, IPC, AMR, just the list goes on. Quality of care has been mentioned. Of course, I come with a certain bias related to quality of care, but it is a critical, important part of the primary healthcare approach to developing health systems of the future. Sure. Thanks, Shams. And Shams highlighted the link with AMR, and for that we have invited uh, Dr. Hanan Balki, our Assistant Director General for AMR, to give us a bit of a sense globally what is happening, what are the issues we need to keep in mind, what is it that we need to be thinking of, and how do we move forward. Hanan, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Your Excellency, welcome to be here, and uh, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure to be in this event. Um, and I want to thank, again, WaterAid for hosting this event. I'm delighted that this evening we will hear more about the global report progress for WASH in healthcare facilities, and most importantly, from the countries on their progress. It is great to have this opportunity ahead of the official launch in a few weeks at the Global WASH meeting in Amman, Jordan. 
Since we're at the World Health Assembly, it is timely to remember that in 2019, the Assembly agreed resolutions on both WASH in healthcare facilities and antimicrobial resistance, both of which are reported in the DG's written progress report to the Assembly this year. And last year, the Assembly passed a resolution for the development of a global strategy to address infection prevention and control. There's a lot of activity on that going right now, which Benedetta had to leave us for. Uh, this is important because essential wash services underpin infection prevention and control, help curb the spread of antimicrobial resistance, and are fundamental foundation for countries to extend primary health care to all. They are vital for making healthcare settings safer, reducing infections, and saving lives. Everyone everywhere should be able to access safe and good quality healthcare. So every healthcare facility should have high quality water, sanitation, hygiene, energy services, as Anshu said, and Shams. But however, that is not the case. An estimate of 8 million people die annually 100 in 137 low and mid-income countries from poor quality care, resulting in $6 trillion of loss. Drug-resistant bacteria, from a recent report, kills 1.3 million annually and is associated with 5 million deaths a year. IPC and WASH could help prevent those deaths. Yet basic WASH services cost, and I had to read this number three times and ask my colleagues, 60 cents per person a year. Not $60, 60 cents. Um, so this report is important to inform what needs to be done. 73 reporting countries have already established baseline data and are reporting and are updating and implementing healthcare wash uh, standards, including climate resilient focus. I look forward to hearing more on the progress of the challenges from some of the countries here tonight. And based on this experience and the evidence and recommendations in the report, WHO and UNICEF will use the launch in June to call upon partners gov and governments to come together and accelerate action, because action is what we need today. This is true for WASH and healthcare facilities, as the forthcoming report makes clear. It is true for infection prevention and control, as global strategy will help to guide. And it is important for AMR, where we have this, this special opportunity at an UNGA high-level meeting in 2024. The DG's progress report to the, WHO, to the WHA this week highlights the need for three main things bold and specific AMR commitments and targets for the UNGA high-level meeting, number two for a clear strategy and targets to address drug-resistant infections in the human health sector, and for urgent funding and technical support for countries to implement their AMR national action plans. And let's be clear that the targets and actions to address AMR should include targets and actions on WASH in healthcare facilities. So in that spirit, of action, of working together, I hope that all of you here this evening from member states, agencies, NGOs and partners will feel motivated to become familiar with the Global Progress Report findings ahead of its release, help disseminate and, out, uh, and outline the report to others, commit to integrate, embed, implement the WASH recommendations in all relevant country strategies and activities. And with that, I'd wish you a very nice evening and all the success and looking forward to listening to the stories. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Hanan. And uh, that 60 cents, if that could prevent AMR, I mean, what would that not, what kind of impact wouldn't that have? It's incredible. And so let's hear now maybe from the national level whether that 60 cents is a realistic uh, figure that countries in low income countries can actually invest in uh, from, uh, let's say, because it's per capita, I suppose. Yeah. And so I would like to call upon the permanent secretary from, um, from the Ministry of Health from Zambia to give us a, an idea of what is happening at the local level, how important this issue is, and whether this 60 cents is an affordable investment for a low-income country. 
Yes, it is. <laughs> Where there is a will, there is always a, a way. And basically, my name is Dr. George Sinyangwe. I'm permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Zambia, and I'm responsible for donor coordination. And I bring you salutations from my ministry. And first, our country uh, wishes to present uh, this uh, statement in uh, support uh, of WASHA activity alongside uh, this uh, uh, health assembly. And basically, as a country, we acknowledge that uh, the delivery of safe, dignified, and health quality health care to everyone is uh, actually what we stand for as a ministry. But for us to be able to do that, we also need to be complemented by a good water supply, sanitation, and hygiene in uh, our health uh, facilities. We believe sincerely that our WASH services will contribute to the protection of healthcare workers, patients, newborn, mothers, and so on and so forth, including the communities surrounding uh, where we provide uh, these services. On the other hand, if we are not able to do that, we actually run a risk of uh, making uh, infections in our facilities spread very quickly. We also run a risk of uh, robbing our patients of uh, the dignity that uh, they require in uh, order to, to comply or and or get uh, the services that uh, we provide. I was going to go into global statistics around uh, WASH, and I have them here, but I think uh, people can uh, read uh, those by themselves from literature. I'm actually going to concentrate on uh, what uh, we are trying to do with uh, the few resources that we have in terms of uh, a WASH. And uh, basically following uh, a global call on, um, the, 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 on WASH, a couple of uh, years ago, we hosted a forum at uh, which we brainstormed around uh, where we needed to go as a country in order to improve our sanitation and basically water supplies at uh, our health uh, facilities. And basically following that uh, engagement, we actually came up uh, with a couple of activities. And activity number one was just uh, to conduct a rapid assessment in terms of where we were uh, around um, the wash activities. And following that uh, assessment, we came up with a couple of uh, ideas. And one of them was to just develop uh, a strategic plan in terms of uh, where we needed to go over the next couple of years. And related to that, we also established uh, an uh, implementation plan. As a result of uh, that plan, some of the things that we've actually done, small but very impactful, is that uh, we encourage that uh, each and every health facility keeps, each, rather the, the country at various designated levels of care have uh, uh, a checklist in terms of what they need to look for related uh, to, to, to improving uh, WASH. And then uh, at all the health facilities, we actually have uh, a multi-sectoral or multi-sectoral committees that try to use the information generated through that checklist in order to advocate where there's no, uh, where things are not happening correctly so that uh, things can actually be corrected. And then uh, we also conduct uh, IPC activities in general in order to educate uh, uh, people around uh, uh, activities related uh, to WASH. But more importantly, and uh, more importantly, and lately, it's about um, the positive or political will. Our current uh, president, Mr. Hagainde Hichilema, has actually pronounced that every health facility should have a uh, running water and uh, a toilet. In fact, if uh, a new facility is constructed and it does not meet uh, that criteria, then it doesn't get to get uh, 
commissioned. But however, even if we've moved the way we've moved, we still have uh, challenges in terms of uh, financing. We are a resource limited country, so we will continue to look for resources with which to improve uh, both uh, water supply, sanitation, and waste management uh, in general. And uh, if there are people in here or organizations in here that are ready to partner with us in terms of improving the way we do business, you are welcome to Zambia. I thank you. Thank you very much, sir, and particularly for highlighting the, next, the steps that countries can follow in order to strengthen the wash in healthcare facilities. First, do assessment, develop a plan, provide a checklist, have a multi-sectoral collaborating uh, coordinating committee, and then finally, of course, a commitment at the highest level from the president. And I think with that commitment, I'm sure that Zambia will be able to invest those 60 cents per year in order to improve wash in healthcare facilities and tackle AMR. So um, we will go into a panel discussion and I would like to call the panel members uh, onto the stage. First I'm going to start with Maggie Montgomery and um, Benedetta you're still on, yes? No alarm bells yet. <laughs> so, uh, and they are going to talk to us a little bit about the latest report that has come out. We will have also uh, Dr. Rose Marlene, the director of the Sambesi Hospital. Uh, and uh, if you are happy to. There you are. And of course, from WHO, uh, we have Dr. Amelia Tui Pulotu, and she is our chief nursing officer. And please welcome. So we're going to kick off with uh, just a few highlights first from the, um, from the Global Progress Report done by WHO and UNICEF uh, on wash and energy in healthcare facilities. Super, thank you, Anshu. If you could pull up the slides. Maybe while the slides are, are being pulled up. So my name is Maggie Montgomery. I'm from the Water Sanitation, Hygiene and Health Unit. And just want to give a few highlights of a global progress report, which is linked to our reporting back on the resolution, which um, Dr. Balki mentioned on WASH and healthcare facilities. So if we could go to the next slide. So the report's going to be launched on the 13th of June, but we'll give you a little sneak teaser and um, hopefully we'll uh, get you to read the full report. First of all, just to highlight, and, and we've already heard it from um, Dr. Balki, that there's major coverage, major gaps in services. And really happy that my colleague, Dr. Rick Johnston, is here, who led this report. Uh, this came out last year, and it was looking at what is the current situation for water, sanitation, hand hygiene, healthcare waste, um, and we've now added electricity. That report, you can see both the reports there came out earlier this year. But in short, there are huge gaps. And I think it's really easy to just kind of glance over these numbers, but one in four healthcare facilities don't have basic water. And basic water is not about water quality or water quantity. It's just having a source of water on site. Um, one in 10 have no sanitation, so that means there's nowhere for the staff, the patients, or their carers to use toilets. Interestingly, on, on hand hygiene, there was a lot of focus, obviously, during COVID about having access to hand hygiene and doing the good practices. We still find that half of healthcare facilities lack basic hand hygiene, which means to have it at the point of care as well as of toilets. So there's similar gaps um, for the other areas. So there's still a lot that needs to be done on, on service provision. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Bothke also mentioned um, what's happening on the country status, and it was great to hear from Zambia that many of what WHO and UNICEF have called the practical steps, and these are very much linked to the 2019 resolution. These are key national actions that need to happen in order to um, achieve sustainable universal access. So, Based on data from 73 countries representing all regions, we found that the most progress was around things like conducting a situational analysis to understand not only at the facility level, but where it sits in policies and, and regulation and that really important accountability aspect. Um, somewhat less countries have developed roadmaps. 
on terms of wash standards and, and waste standards, we see again that there's been some progress. And the green here is countries have fully adopted and implemented and are actively regulating and disseminating things like standards. And for healthcare waste, it's up to 53%. Many of these are focusing on issues around sustainability and climate resilience, like no burn technologies, reducing waste, less waste. So that's, this is where most of the progress is happening. The right side of that plot is looking at where we see the least progress. Um, and this is about doing wide-scale infrastructure improvements. So going beyond pilot districts and pilot facilities, but really nationwide, making sure the budgets are there, making sure the, the technologies that are scalable and affordable are put in place. Um, monitoring, also, there's a lot more that needs to be done. We found that only 14% of countries that responded were, had integrated wash indicators into HMIS. And without this regular government monitoring, that accountability isn't there. Even at the, at the, at the Capitol, you would ask many um, health ministers or even, even on, in the wash community what the situation is, and they, and they don't know. Uh, similarly, if we look at workforce and community engagement, there's still a lot more that needs to be done. So certainly on the right side is, is, is where we see that a lot more um, action needs to happen. Next slide. Uh, just a few key insights. Um, progress is far off track, so we're not on track. Um, and we need to scale up and we need to accelerate. On the technical side, we see that things are happening around baselines and standards and training, but we're not integrating how we need to integrate within the health programs and primary care, child maternal health, AMR, are all three really important examples, and we're not achieving scale. Tools are out there, so WHO and UNICEF updated recently the Water and Sanitation for Health Facility Improvement Tool. It's used in over 50, 50 countries, um, but it only can take you so far if you don't have a regular budget and you don't have that leadership, uh, in particular at the facility and increasingly at the municipal level where a lot of these um, budgets are actually allocated. We've heard a lot about this number, so I'm not gonna repeat it, but it's not that expensive and the cost savings are huge. Um, and then lastly, just to say that we did see increased government spending on prevention. And if anybody read the health accounts report that came out last December, there was a big kind of upswing, but we've seen it actually go back down again. So we're kind of at this prime moment now to see if, if we can use some of that initial momentum around COVID to really make some sustainable investments in primary health care, quality care, and WASH. So my last slide, and then I'll hand it over to um, Benedetta, who's going to talk briefly on, on IPC, is that there's three main, three main actions. So first of all, we have to do a lot more on, on, on integration. And it's great that you're all here today, but we really need to think practically how this gets integrated at the country level. I think that's where kind of the, the, the challenge lies. On monitoring and reviewing progress, again, this needs to continue and we need to strengthen accountability. Fantastic to hear about potentially including an indicator in the new child maternal health resolution. Um, we heard also on the AMR side, there's an opportunity. So the more we can use the data that already exists and integrate it into other health resolutions um, and, and mechanisms is, is quite hopeful. There's also an UNGA resolution that's being proposed on safe and sustainable infrastructure and in healthcare facilities. So looking obviously also at energy, um, which would be happening later this year. So that's another mechanism to kind of keep that political pressure and accountability. And the last is about developing and empowering the health workforce, um, not only to deliver and maintain WASH, but to make sure that they can practice those hygiene services. Things like cleaners, like waste workers that often are neglected and, and don't receive the, the, the training or the support they need. They're quite critical to making this all happen. So thank you, and I'll hand it to Benedetta. So thanks, Maggie, and good afternoon, everyone, as well. So Maggie uh, mentioned the three way points for the way forward, and I really would like to add an additional one, which actually she, anyway, embedded uh, in her last slide, which is really integration between IPC and WASH, so IPC infection prevention and control, in particular at the healthcare facility level. It's really important to have a strong integration between these two elements in order to achieve 
especially uh, patient outcomes, improvement of patient outcomes, but also health, health worker safety um, in healthcare facilities. And in fact, uh, we know since ever that these two elements integrate each other. And uh, in particular, as it is represented in the slide, um, which was meant to be animated, but anyway, it's fine. Um, infection prevention and control is central to achieving quality care for all uh, by ensuring that those who access and provide care are safe from infection, including uh, antimicrobial resistant infections through evidence-based, timely, efficient, and compassionate interventions integrated within clinical pathways. On the other hand, um, WASH really is essential to provide the necessary infrastructure, equipment, materials, enabling the implementation of appropriate IPC practices. Without, we heard from Maggie, without hand hygiene services, which is a wash element at the point of care in half of the facilities in the world, how can we achieve safe care delivered to people and also for health workers? So, uh, in fact, this is the reason why some, some years ago we included wash as, as core component eight of of effective IPC programs as part of the built environment which enables IPC practices at the point of care. So as you can see in the slide, in the big arrow, we are at crucial time for infection prevention and control, including WASH, in the history because for the first time last year a resolution was passed on infection prevention and control in healthcare and today or tomorrow, there is a global strategy which is being hopefully ab adopted by all member states. And we are in the trajectory of developing a global action plan and a monitoring framework for infection prevention and control. So these, um, these strategic approaches through these global documents are really aimed at the end at enabling safe care across the continuum of the health system, which is represented there, in order to avoid infection at the point of care, transmission of harmful pathogens at the point of care. And WASH, as I said, it's critical to achieve this goal which we have. So this is why I'm strongly convinced that while doing global action plans and monitoring framework for infection prevention and control, we need to have WASH at the core. We have already discussed with our colleagues about, for example, having one of the key high-level targets uh, for the monitoring framework for IPC be a WASH indicator in healthcare facilities. So I'm sure we will achieve that and we will discuss that in, in this global meeting which will take place in a few weeks. So just in conclusion, really thanking very much, first of all, my colleagues at WHO from, from WASH and also other disciplines such as AMR uh, for a very, very fruitful collaboration and really thanking a lot also UNICEF, WaterAid, other stakeholders for all the leadership they play in advocacy and also for the strong support they provide to, to us at WHO as, a, as one team working on WASH and um, IPC, including for emergencies, so we are all together in one team. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And I think we've looked at the interrelationship between many different issues. So providing WASH means you can reduce, um, you can improve IPC, but that means that you'd have less AMR, you'd have improved quality of care, but less AMR contributes to improve quality of care. And so uh, these issues are all interlinked. But I just wanted to reflect a little bit on that figure that 
um, Maggie didn't want to mention because I was counting and how many zeros are there actually? <laughs> and, it, and if I look at, we are a population of 8 billion people now and with the 60 cent investment per capita that would be 480 million dollars per year and the return was six trillion dollars. That means that is for every dollar invested, 24 to 25, let's say 25 dollars on return. Am I correct, Bruce? I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that. Yeah, but that is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. That is incredible. That is one of the highest cost-effective interventions that we have, similar to family planning or immunization. So. Um, I just wanted to highlight that point because I think um, it didn't come out from, from, from yeah, very clearly from I'm all those, use Anshu's words. <laughs> from all those <laughs> figures, all those zeros that we saw there. So um, let me go to Dr. Rosa Marlene, who is the director of the Zambesi Hospital, and particularly for you to talk a little bit about what does this mean at the facility level for the healthcare worker if there is no wash in the healthcare facility and um, how do you experience that and what can you as a manager potentially do about that and what is your experience around that and how can the health workforce, the healthcare workers address this issue? It's on. It's on. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, first of all good evening Excellency and uh, colleagues. Um, just to start uh, I would like to share that um, my, the, His Excellency, the President of uh, Mozambique, participated at the high-level opening ceremony of 76 WHA and the celebration of 75 years of WHO. What is important here to highlight is, in his speech, one important issue he highlighted was the accessibility of safe drinking water in Mozambique which has been increasing from the very, very lowest level, less than 10%, uh, to, <coughs> excuse me, to 38% in, 2000, in 2015, uh, to 45% correctly. So this is a, a, a very good achievement because it means that almost 5 million of Mozambicans now have access to a safe water. So in this uh, uh, long journey toward access to safe water, Mozambique has been, implement, imp, has been implemented by this uh, long journey to access to safe water has been implemented by the government of Mozambique in a multi sectoral approach, which means the inclusion of other minister, Minister of Water and, and uh, Public Service and Minister of Health, of, uh, Minister of Education. And uh, of course, our partners, including WHO, UNICEF, and particularly Water Aid. So, um, and also I would like to highlight that um, uh, the theme chosen for this 76 World Health Assembly is saving lives, delivering health for all. However, without safe water, there is no life. And of course, the world would never reach the goal of health for all. Uh, in our, my understanding, and I think for other colleagues here, life begins and ends in water and at health facilities. Health workers are the key to deliver lifetime safe care. Therefore, health workers need access to safe water at the health facilities as well as at the served communities. Uh, all of us were aware of the importance of safe water and sanitation in the prevention and control of infection and other, uh, other health issues like uh, uh, maternal and child, uh, child health as was shared this, uh, this afternoon. But from COVID-19 pandemic, we learned how vital was safe water and sanitation to save our lives, not only in the health facility, but everywhere. Uh, so coming to my question, how is practicing health 
care without safe water? My answer is simple. That is not health care. Uh, but unfortunately, in African region, most countries, particularly my country, Mozambique, are facing a shortage of safe water, but we're still providing care without it. Sometimes requesting our patients, particularly women, to bring water from their homes or to help us and fetch water around the health facilities. I recall around 10 years ago, uh, we had a cholera outbreak in a remote community. There was health facilities and the uh, health workers, but uh, the, the source of water was away, uh, was five kilometers away from the health facilities. In normal condition, this was acceptable because the health facility was built at high zone to prevent it from floods. But with color, this was powerful. In February this year, following the cyclone threat strike in many cities in Mozambique, such as Cap Delgado, uh, Zambia, and Sofala province, the very important risk factor for cholera spread was shortage of safe water at communities and was at health facilities due to destruction of water supply system. So, so the cyclone washed up all, all the health system supplies. So, um, so I think now we're facing another, another challenge that beside of providing water, beside of building systems to, to, to supply water, those systems should be resilient to climate change. Particularly among us, I mean, among, uh, uh, among us in Africa, and particularly in my country, who is actually at high risk of natural disasters, which they took away the health facilities, the water system, and leaving us with nothing to do, even in the health facilities. Which, and we have to continue, continue providing health care to all of us without water. So uh, from this experience, which I think are not unique to my country, uh, my Minister of Health uh, and uh, in multi uh, approach made the availability of water source one of the most important conditions to build a health facility, so to provide water, to make water as close as possible to the health workers. Of course, there are some exceptions, such as in the desertification and high zones, we have to still provide in care. And it, is it's, it, and it is in this situation where it's particularly important uh, uh, our partnership with uh, our um, which, uh, organization like uh, South Water, Water Aid to provide safe water to our communities and health facility to ensure safe health care and safe lives. So for us, it's important actually, as uh, the uh, Premier Secretary of Zambia said, that uh, for us it's important to still have a partnership because we're doing all of, all of we can, but uh, our uh, economic condition, our financial restriction don't allow us to go further and to go as much as, uh, I mean, um, speed out as it is needed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosa, for highlighting a that uh, healthcare without water is care without water is not really healthcare. But I think you highlighted some of the planning challenges that you faced because you said, on the one hand, you wanted to have the health facility higher up so that it wouldn't be flooded, but that the result of that was that your source of water was five kilometers away, and how do you? How do you bring that closer to the health facility? And I think, of course, climate change is going to make that even more difficult for many countries. But yeah, how are we going to address that, I think, is a crucial question to keep in mind when we look at planning for new facilities, etc. And we should actually think about that, I think, a very good point. So, uh, Dr. Amelia, um, coming to you, uh, I would like to you to reflect on two particular issues. One, as a former Minister of Health, on how um, WASH could be part of the solutions that are part of healthcare provision and how healthcare workers can contribute to that. And secondly, now that you're the chief nursing officer, 
um, what do you think that we at the global level should do and how can we contribute to this? Hello. Thank you. WASH progress is far off track. And that is uh, something that I have been pondering about. I have four things to share this evening, given my past experiences and uh, thinking uh, while as a chief nurse uh, in WHO. No wash for me impact <coughs> or it may means no respect, no dignity, no compassion, no safe, let alone quality care for the vulnerable population that we promise to serve. That is very important to me. And at the frontier of care, nurses and midwives come every day to practice in a working environment that doesn't respect them as healthcare professionals. So that is uh, very critical. We expect our nurses from national, subnational, rural, remote, and outer islands to deliver safe and respectful, compassionate care for the population. But we do not provide them with the very fundamental basic to ensure that they come to a working environment that is respectful of them and their practice. I have visited a lot of healthcare facilities, both in Tonga, in the Pacific, and in Asia. I have seen nurses and midwives as key provider and leader of healthcare facilities at rural subnational, rural and remote and outer islands. In some situations, the only healthcare provider for a very vulnerable community. And he, right here and now, I would like to applaud uh, the work of nurses uh, and midwives contributing uh, to wash in healthcare facilities. Julie and Maggie, and of course, your whole team, Bernadette. But of course, as we are far off track, for me, I was pondering, maybe respect, you know, because I need to be respected first as I deliver care, as I come to work, to my working environment, in order for me as a nurse um, to continue that continuum of respect to everything else that I do. So that is the challenge for us um, here today. The very first one is the potential impact of no wash on respect and quality safe and compassionate care for the population as it will eventually, may eventually lead to negative impact on the population. The second one is the hope for some transformation of health systems and healthcare for the future. Wash in healthcare facilities is the foundation for transformation. Without ensuring that there are basic water, sanitation, hygiene, electricity, climate efficiencies, within healthcare facilities, I don't think there is much hope for transformation and for leaving no one behind. So we need to do the very first step first. In Tonga, when I became minister, Dr. Andrew, I already knew the situation out there, but I visited again and again and again, healthcare professionals at the outer islands, nurses, midwives, and doctors are just calling me to all everything within the infrastructure of the healthcare facilities, wash 
facilities that are non-functional, sometimes unsafe, and are not available. Maybe available half of the day and not available 24-7 during care. And imagine when a woman comes to the healthcare facility and there is no water and the nurse has to walk somewhere to, to get water, to wash her hands, to better care and safe care for the patient. So when I became minister, I actually uh, asked the team of biomedical, the biomedical team to build a, a very strong team. And I really asked push outward because we need to uh, ensure uh, geographical uh, implementation, in particular the rural and remote islands. Of course, it was very tough because we need to convince Minister of Finance uh, and, and that is tough on its own. But also we need to build capabilities on the ground who are able to um, build those infrastructures in place. You know, when I ask the biomedical what needs to be done and he gives me the details, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be put in place for water sanitation and environmental um, um, wastage, uh, proper waste management. The third uh, th thing that I would like to share is the importance of uh, engagement of nurses and midwives to lead the work on washing healthcare facilities. They are the one who have been having the experience at the frontier of care, who have in-depth understanding of the problems, of the enablers, of the solutions, innovations and transformation that needs to be made for the future. Local innovation that are sustainable. So we need their voices, their ideas, and their leadership to support us moving forward with, with WASH in healthcare facilities. And of course, the very last one, and I'm very happy to see that, is the presidential um, leadership on WASH in healthcare facilities. This is prime time. And of course, presidential with Minister for Health and Minister for Finance, so that there is sustainable and predictable financing because Washington Healthcare Facilities is for the long haul uh, for care. Uh, it's not uh, an implementation now, it is uh, for the long haul and for the long run. Uh, for me, uh, given that we are off track, uh, we need uh, to uh, be able to uh, act um, on uh, all the actions that have been uh, proposed forward so that we can move uh, the needle uh, towards a respectful, uh, compassionate, um, gender equity and empowerment of nurses and midwives to deliver quality, safe care at all healthcare facilities. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Amelia, and particularly for highlighting that connection with respectful care. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, White Ribbon Alliance did a survey called What Women Want, and particularly looking at what was important for them in relation to maternal health and maternal health care. And there were two things that came out. One, respectful care, to be treated respectfully when they go to the health facility. And secondly, wash in the health facilities, because otherwise, you know, there was no sanitation, nothing, etc. And I think you're just highlighting how important that is, but also how important that is for the healthcare worker. And we know it's only 60 cents per capita per year. So I think <laughs> it's worth investing those 60 cents with a $25 return on every dollar. Um, so, thank you very much. We have um, a couple of comments that we can take from the floor. And um, IFSMA, are you in the room? There you are. I think you mean I have to. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's fine. 
Um, hello everyone, I'm uh, Dr. Salman. I am a part of the International Federation of Medical Students Associations, which is a network of 1.5 million medical students worldwide. Um, so as young or future healthcare professionals, we are deeply concerned about the great challenges of the century and the threats they pose to the provision of WASH. Uh, unfortunately, the multiple environmental crises that we are currently facing pose a threat to uh, the provision of what WASH at healthcare facilities. These include uh, climate change, environmental pollution, water scarcity during heat waves, floods and heavy rainfall, uh, which favor infectious and vector-borne diseases and disruptive uh, wash infrastructures caused by climate disasters. Uh, as we see, all of them underlie the need of uh, climate-resilient wash services and healthcare facilities as a crucial part of climate adaptation. So if we fail to provide equal access of wash now, these inequalities or inequities will only deep be deepened by the climate emergency. So we as a future health workforce, we believe in the important role we play in ensuring safer and healthier spaces uh, at point of care. Hence, we uh, call everyone attending this event to uh, first recognize the role of communities as important stakeholders in WASH progress, increasing cooperation with uh, youth-led and civil society organizations in tackling WASH inequalities. Uh, the second would be developing interventions to increase access to WASH within all levels of care at both urban and rural areas, taking into consideration vulnerable populations and those without safe access to water. Third, uh, and the last one, uh, to invest in climate resilient wash services to strengthen health systems resilience and preparedness and uh, also promote equal access to essential healthcare services. Thank you. Thank you and uh, thank you also so much for highlighting that issue about this. This is a multi-partner uh, engagement that we need to undertake. Um, I'm wondering whether there's someone here from the Ministry of Health from Ghana. No. Okay. In that case, I think we've come to the end of this panel, and I'm going to hand over to my co-moderator, Shams. Thank you very much, Anshu, and um, what a wonderful panel. Um, we've got some serious information to digest. I know many colleagues in this room are fully familiar with all of that information. Others may not be, but it's really the important part of this is to amplify whatever you've heard and the wisdom that you've heard in this first panel. Um, we now move into the second panel and really building on the logic of the first, now focusing in on the leadership side. And we're really privileged to um, have with us the Honorable Minister of Health from Malawi. If I could invite you to join us here, um, uh, Honorable Kumbizi Chupanda. Um, and then we are very privileged to have the Honorable Minister of Health and Social Development in Mali, um, Honorable Diminatu Sangare. Um, please, thank you. And yes, yes, you're going to translate, are you? Yeah. Yes, yes. yes, please, please do, please do. Um, and Ms. Catherine Mengani, Please. Thank you so much, nurse activist and chapter lead, Women in Global Health, Kenya. And Sarah, Sarah Thompson, fantastic, lead policy specialist for health and SRIGR in SIDA. Please, please take a seat. And finally, Chandi Wira Chisi, head of policy from Waterade Malawi. Wonderful, thank you. Just wanted to keep that gender balance going on this panel, please. Yeah. <laughs> please have a seat. Okay, so this is a this is, this is uh, now getting into really the national level nitty gritties and actually having a Minister of Health in this room to give us a direct answer to some questions that I'm sure she faces continuously in her day uh, to day activities. And looking at the pro issues with the facility, looking at the issues at the sub-national level and looking at the issues at national level, the question is really, very difficult to answer, but we'd love to hear your wisdom on it. Um, what can be done? What opportunities are there in Malawi to maximize opportunities and impact domestic and donor investment in WASH, in healthcare facilities? So really focusing in 
on the steps that Malawi has taken, the opportunities and impacts, and particularly any lessons that can be shared for other countries. Minister. Uh, thank you so much uh, for giving us the opportunity uh, to share the Malawi experience on this very important topic uh, about a wash. Uh, and let me also thank the first panel uh, for laying the ground you know, on the importance of uh, wash facilities, water, electricity, hygiene and sanitation in healthy facilities. Uh, and if there's indeed uh, one area in which most of our hospitals, healthy facilities struggle with, it's uh, utility bills. I'm sure my fellow honorable ministers, if there's a bill which you know uh, we struggle with, it is a bill of water and also the bill of uh, electricity. And, but indeed, the water is life. Water is very important. So in Malawi, we have a couple of tools uh, which we use um, on the issues of wash, but also which help us to uh, mobilize uh, resources. We are aware that you know most of the times government resources they are never enough, especially in the health sector, uh, because of so many priorities uh, which we have to look at. So we have the health sector strategic plan, which is like the overarching uh, plan, uh, and it also has uh, it recognizes the importance of wash in healthcare facilities. Apart from that, we also have the national sanitation and hygiene strategy, uh, which we has been, we've been using from 2018, uh, and it's going to expire uh, this year, uh, 2023, and it also includes wash in healthy facilities. Apart from that, we also recognize the importance of environment. So we have an environmental health policy, uh, which also has wash as one of the uh, strong pillars. Uh, but also, as a ministry, we have uh, adopted the wash fit uh, and we have rolled out. Uh, the importance of the wash fit um, too is that it will help us to identify the challenges, the gaps, and the priorities, as well as the cost interventions, especially in the hard to reach areas. In town, things are a little bit easier. But in the hard to reach areas, in the rural areas where most of our people are, it is very, very difficult. So this tool of wash feet is going to help us, but also to uh, mobilize the resources, both from treasury, but also from our, our partners. We are grateful to partners like WaterAid and their partners because uh, they have been really of support to the uh, Minister of Health in a number of facilities. They have helped us to improve wash uh, facilities in almost over 48 health facilities in Malawi uh, to the tune of five million uh, pounds, which is a lot. And, but also we are grateful to KWV to Kowota, UNFPA, and also UNICEF, who also have assisted us in you know, uh, constructing new wash facilities, but also rehabilitation. Because if there's one thing which I think all of us, we need to pay more attention, it is the issue of maintenance uh, in our facilities. Uh, we lose so much more, and you know, we, it also costs us a lot, you know, because we don't have proper, proper maintenance uh, protocols or procedures, which I feel that really we need also uh, to prioritize it. As a government uh, uh, commitment, uh, from the Treasury. Uh, this year, they have also increased our budget for wash for health uh, for the health center facilities. Uh, it used to be 23,000 uh, US dollars, but this year, at least they have increased it. It is now 400,000 uh, US dollars in this year's uh, fiscal year. Uh, but that is just to show that indeed, also as government, we are very much committed to the issues of wash. Let me stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Minister. Really clear points and actually highlighting particularly the linkage between health sector strategic planning and very granular level technical work on wash. So there's many things to t take out from your, your remarks. Uh, let's hear from Honourable Minister uh, from Mali, please.
Merci, merci beaucoup. Je vais m'exprimer en français. Thank you very much. I will speak in French. Euh, je commence d'abord par vous remercier de m'avoir donné cette opportunité. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for giving me this opportunity. Et avant de commencer, je voudrais remercier tous les partenaires qui appuient le ministère de la Santé et du Développement Social dans le domaine de l'eau et de l'assainissement. Before starting, I'd like to thank all the partners assisting the Ministry of Health and Social Development in et, water and sanitation. Et, et l'Organisation mondiale de la santé, OMS, euh, avec sa représentation régionale au Mali, vient justement tout récemment de nous appuyer dans le domaine de l'hygiène et de l'assainissement dans les établissements de santé dans un hôpital. WHO, with its regional support in Mali, recently supported us in l'hygiène et l'assainissement dans un hygiene hospital. hygiène and sanitation within a hospital facility. Par la formation des agents qui s'occupent de l'hygiène et de la santé, de l'hygiène et de l'assainissement dans un hôpital de Bamako. By training health and sanitation agents within a hospital in Bamako. 200 personnes ont été formées. 200 people have been trained. Et à la fin de la formation, nous avons reçu des poubelles pour mettre en pratique ce qu'ils ont appris. And by the end of the training, we were given garbage bin to practice what they have learned. Et je voudrais encore une fois remercier l'OMS pour ça. I'd like to thank WHO once more because of that. Maintenant, euh, la question euh, d'hygiène de l'eau et de l'assainissement est une euh, question, un problème qui est porté par le président lui-même de la transition, le chef de l'État, le colonel Assimi Goïta. The question of hygiene and sanitation is a question that is very dear to our president Assimi Goïta himself. Et je vais faire un témoignage. Quand j'ai pris fonction, j'ai fait le tour de quelques établissements de santé communautaire à l'intérieur du Mali. When I have started as a minister, I have turned, uh, I have visited some healthcare facilities and communal facilities for healthcare in Mali. Et j'ai fait le compte rendu au président à mon retour. And I reported to the president once I was back. À la date d'aujourd'hui, le président a mis à la disposition des communautés dans les villages, dans les centres de santé communautaires, plus de 260 forages. In today's day, the president has given communities and villages, schools as well, you were saying earlier, plus de 260 forages, over 260 boreholes, pour donner l'accès à l'eau potable aux populations dans les communautés, to provide, aux centres de santé. To provide access to uh, drinkable water in villages and in healthcare facilities and communities. Donc, et je remercie les panélistes qui sont passés et Madame la Ministre, pour tout ce que vous avez dit, c'est vrai. I would like to thank all the panelists that were here earlier and Madam Minister, everything you said was true. Parce que euh, j'ai vu avant le don du président euh, un centre de santé communautaire où il y a une maternité où il n'y avait pas d'eau. Pas de maternité, mais les agents de santé communautaire qui aident les femmes à accoucher, mais il n'y avait pas d'eau là-bas. Because before the president's intervention, I've seen a maternity facility where there was no water. Et c'était très difficile. It was very difficult. Et les agents de santé, vous avez raison, on a besoin de l'eau pour assurer la sécurité sanitaire à l'intérieur des structures de santé. Healthcare workers are right. We need water to ensure um, to ensure cleanliness within the healthcare facilities. Nous avons des maladies tropicales négligées pour lesquelles nous avons contre la, pour la lutte contre laquelle nous avons besoin de l'eau. We have neglected tropical diseases that we need to fight and for that fight we need water. Je prends l'exemple euh, du TRACOM que le Mali vient juste d'éliminer en 2023. Mais les gens n'avaient même pas de quoi se laver le visage, le, les yeux, les enfants. C'est pourquoi il y avait le TRACOM et on ne parvenait pas euh, à l'éliminer, avec beaucoup d'autres causes. Mais il y a l'absence de l'eau qui était un facteur déterminant. People didn't have anything to even wash their face, which has contributed in spreading trachom and water was missing. Et au Mali, nous avons nous sommes en train de de d'activer de dynamiser la plateforme One Health. In Mali, we're activating and dynamizing the platform One Health. Parce que c'est une question multisectorielle. 
because it's a multi-sectoral question. On a besoin, même si on met les infrastructures, les infrastructures, on arrive à mettre l'eau potable et tout. Il faudrait que beaucoup de secteurs participent. Even if we put up infrastructures, we give access to sanitize water. We need infrastructures to follow up. Et donc, le Mali a mis en place un plan pour la question, un plan stratégique national pour la, la période de 2023 à 2027. Mali has put up a national strategy for a period from 2023 to 2027. Pour l'amélioration des conditions d'accès à l'eau potable. For the improvement of conditions of access Wash to hygiene water. assainissement dans les établissements de santé. Wash hygiene assainissement in healthcare facilities. Et ce plan a été validé, ce plan stratégique a été validé au niveau politique et est suivi par le haut niveau politique du Mali, par le chef de l'État et par le gouvernement. This strategical plan has been politically approved and has been est suivi par le gouvernement and is followed by the government et le chef de and the head of state. Mais il y a des problèmes et tout le monde a parlé de problèmes financiers. Donc, euh, on a, il y a besoin euh, d'un accompagnement financier pour euh, justement mettre en œuvre ce plan stratégique. However, there are issues, as everyone mentioned, financial issues. We need financial support to le, pour mettre en œuvre le plan. To put in motion the plan. Et, et si on doit intégrer aussi dans le budget des établissements de santé, il y a toujours le problème financier. And if we need integration within uh, the healthcare budget, we always need. Il y a le financier. There's always a financial issue. Donc, euh, les plaidoyers, c'est le même pour tout le monde au niveau du gouvernement. Donc, euh, moi-même, déjà, c'est d'augmenter le budget de la santé au niveau national dans le domaine de l'eau, de l'assainissement et de l'hygiène. Therefore, we all ask for the same thing, the government and myself included, is to increase the national health budget. Et puis, tous les partenaires, que ce soit des partenaires nationaux, euh, internationaux, que je salue encore une fois, qui nous appuient. Merci. I greet once more all the partners nationally, internationally involved with us who support us. Uh, Merci. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. Very, very clear. And uh, picking up on this high level political commitment from the president, I think this is another really important point that we need to remind ourselves and also really figuring out that the the dollar signs count, right? So actually, I know it's a traditionally very hard to uh, encounter into those discussions, but those are really important pieces. And you also highlighted that facility realities need to be um, tr tr uh, projected into those national um, strategies. Um, let's now come to Ms. Catherine Mengani, um, if I may, just to give, hear your perspectives um, on the po question post on leadership. Over to you. Thank you so much. I wish to take myself back to a rural health facility. I am a nurse. I'm also a field epidemiologist. So in those, that perspective, I work in a health facility. There's one latrine that it's used by both patients, healthcare workers, nurses, midwives, anyone walking in. Then you go inside. There's a mother in labor. We know very well and understand what happens in the maternity. And you have to perform that delivery. As you're continuing with your work, you have to go to the MCH clinic where there are young children and they need you to give immunization. So the question that rings in my mind is without water. And yet we all know there's only one thing that can prevent spread of diseases, washing of hands. So as we start the conversation, I'm asking myself, as a healthcare provider, as a nurse, at that rural health facility, without water, without IPC implementation done, there's a lot that will come out. That's why we'll have conversation of diseases that could have been prevented by that frontline healthcare worker if only they are supported. So I will echo, frontline healthcare workers, they are the agents of change. Nurses and midwives, 
are the agents of implementation of WASH and ensuring this quality of care to all patients and clients coming to health facilities. One key thing is we are talking about primary health care, achieving primary health care. I will still echo what I said all the days that I've been here. Without healthcare workers, there is no primary health care. Without healthcare workers, WASH can never be successful. And um, they can only do this while they have better working conditions. So the only thing we cry is as leaders, as partners, people who are supporting different activities, as we are setting up policies, are we thinking about the healthcare providers at the lowest level? Because they are the ones who can make all this be achieved. 70% of healthcare workers are women. 90% in Africa are women. That tells us a lot. In decision-making tables when it comes to WASH, do we have women? Because these are the problems affecting them and they are the most, the number of women in this workforce. There are so many. But in making decisions, are we putting them among the decision-making tables to have their voice to say what would work well in WASH programs? Because they are the ones almost at all levels of care managing the clients and the patients. So the key things that I call to action will be, one, we need to have and monitor. We've talked about data, and I was interested to see if this data is also disaggregated by age, uh, by sex and gender. Uh, I really would want to see WASH data that is disaggregated by sex and gender because it will give us as healthcare providers, as nurses and midwives, an overview to look at what are the key interventions to put because we'll see where is the who is mostly affected by this and or, or whoever is speaking, like if it's the female, because I know the female population are the ones that can be most affected. Where is the exact place that we need interventions to be put in place to have success stories on a WASH program that is going on? Then we need to design proper resources and deliver system based on a gender responsive policy and health services for WASH. Are we having the gender lens? So this need to turn the tables around. So as healthcare providers, we are asking us, as we do all this, let us look at it and ask what is best for the healthcare providers. The people who are able to make this a success their voices is very, very key in this. I'll still echo, we cannot achieve WASH programs, we cannot achieve primary health care without the health care workers in it. Thank you. Wonderfully put, Catherine, and actually just bringing us back to healthcare workers and also women healthcare workers. Really, really important points. Um, and also emphasizing the leadership is at the facility level as well. Sometimes we get into the national level leadership but with facility level leadership. Let's now come to Sarah, Sarah Thompson. Um, what opportunities do you see for unlocking financing from everything that you've heard today? Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm not sure everybody knows what CEDA is, so I'm representing the Swedish government. I work for uh, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, and I was just reflecting, Catherine, when you were talking about uh, how hand washing saves lives. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but uh, we've had midwives for 300 years in Sweden, and uh, we, we've been tracking the maternal mortality statistics over those um, 300, well, maybe the last 150 years anyway. And uh, I know that there was a major breakthrough, I think between like around, between like around 1865, <laughs> we're going way back in time, but um, where we saw um, when hand washing was introduced to the midwives, we saw a major drop in maternal mortality. I mean, at this time, we still had very high numbers, probably like 450 per 100,000. But I know there was a major drop at the time. So, um, and then that continued to go down with, um, with different um, innovations. But I couldn't agree with you more. At CEDA, um, we're going to be very, very practical now. How do you unlock financing from our perspective? Um, two critical areas uh, where we 
that we believe would facilitate uh, funding to wash in healthcare facilities. One is demonstrating absorption capacity. And the second is connecting wash investments and health outcomes. And that's where these monitoring systems come in. And CEDA as a development partner has a role to support both of these areas. So we believe that absorption capacity is enhanced by costed roadmaps or investment plans. And I believe that Dr. Emilia uh, talked about identifying those infrastructure needs, but putting a price tag on them. And one example of this uh, is in Rwanda, where our partners, uh, WaterAid, UNICEF, and others developed regional investment plans, which facilitated more efficient funding allocation and is actually expected to lead to a higher level of execution of the nationally allocated WASH budget. And in addition, because there was an investment plan, additional funding that became available at CEDA at short notice was able then to be directly uh, di directed to WaterAid Rwanda, who based on that investment plan uh, could efficiently make use of the funds. So this example shows how, from a development partner perspective, prepared and costed plans enable efficient use of funds and lower the bar to allocate funding. And of course, um, this investment readiness or attractiveness is also enhanced when sustainability is addressed in these plans. So addressing the long-term value for money of the investment. And this is an aspect where the wash and health sectors need to be coordinated and work strategically together. Now, CETA is always ready to explore opportunities to leverage blended finance through different mechanisms, but we can't turn to private investors before there's an investment readiness and a realistic and sustainable investment possibilities. The second opportunity that I mentioned is connecting WASH in healthcare facility investments with concrete health results such as maternal mortality. And that we believe will increase the ability and the likelihood of investment. It's essential to clearly make that connection in order for it to be raised as a political priority, which it has been in Mali, for example, in Malawi, and to help funders both domestically and otherwise to understand why it should be included as part of health system strengthening efforts. Um, data from in, uh, indicator monitoring uh, helps, is essential to make that connection between WASH improvements and health outcomes. Although, as, uh, as you mentioned in the report, only 14% of uh, countries in the world are actually including uh, WASH as a health system strengthening indicator. Um, and we believe that that um, needs to really change um, in order to demonstrate the relationship between WASH and healthcare facilities and key health outcomes. And finally, CEDA is fortunate that we're able to provide uh, uh, channel support in the form of core support to organizations, um, giving them flexibility to address systems issues. And we'd like to urge other donors uh, to move towards core funding. But where this isn't possible, uh, that partner organizations support countries with a system-wide support based on a thorough analysis to address different bottlenecks. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you so much, Sarah. And that's very clear. And maybe also colleagues may want to have a conversation with Sarah after the, the session. But this is very clear in terms of the costed investment plan approach and the linkage with health systems. Uh, very, very clear. Now we'll turn to the gentleman on the panel. Um, let's come to Chandriwa. So, what has and should be? So, what has been and what should be the role of civil society? in unlocking financing and promoting political leadership uh, for WASH in healthcare facilities. Okay, um, thank you very much, moderator. Uh, the dilemma of being the last speaker is that usually you run the risk of walking back on what has already been said. So if I do that, just know that that's the reason. Uh, suffice to say that I'm going to provide a reflection based on the experience of what I aid Malawi. 
Um, I, I think uh, really it's, um, to begin with, it's a question of making that conscious decision to appreciate that uh, wash in healthcare facilities is very important. And for water aid, it made that decision way back in 2014, prior to the development of its strategy, it made a strategic decision to enter or to venture into wash in health, which was a fairly new area for water aid at that time. And then uh, after that, there was an interesting development. Normally there's a media house in our country which holds annual events of raising resources for maternal health. So our country director was requested to take the challenge and she went out to sleep at a healthcare facility to appreciate what happens there, what women go through. So she was there for a couple of days. And coming back from there, she was a completely changed person. She, didn't, she couldn't believe that every day women are subjected to what she saw at that particular pl place. And she made a conscious decision to step up and do something about it. And that led to the birth of a challenge, which we took upon ourselves and called it 150 Healthcare Facility Challenge. The idea was that Water Aid Malawi would raise resources and invest into improving WASH in 75 healthcare facilities, and then use that as a learning point to influence others, including government, to invest in the other 75 healthcare facilities. As you heard from the minister, who is my minister from my country, uh, up to this point, we've done 48 healthcare facilities, and we are doing the last batch of, uh, the next batch of 15, which will take us to about 63. So we're just short of hitting the 75 target. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this to dispel the notion that raising resources for work in wash in healthcare facilities is impossible. We've been able to demonstrate that through the work that we've been able to do. And we believe that it's the way to go because the benefits are really very obvious. If you look around the room here, there's a lot of graphics depicting the benefits of the work that we have done and that we continue to do. We didn't just stop there. When the opportunity for a resolution uh, on wash and healthcare facilities was passed, we opted to take lead and work with the Ministry of Health to basically land that on the ground. And uh, we've been working with the Ministry since then, and we're working towards coming up with a costed roadmap of wash and healthcare facilities. It's almost done. There are just a few things to be done. The point is, the Ministry cannot work effectively in that area if it doesn't consciously put it in its plans, and if it doesn't cost its needs. So that's pointing towards effectively mobilizing resources for work around that. So we think we're moving in the right direction, and we believe that the collaboration with the ministry is going to continue for the benefit of uh, the country. Um, again, we are also looking at what we did by identifying those resources. Like I said, we demonstrated, we've been able to engage a number of uh, development partners, USID, are financing the lot that we are working on now, the 15 health care facilities, through a project called Momentum Health. And then uh, we've also worked with GIZ. They've been able to support quite a number of um, health care facilities. We have also worked with the then DFID, now FCDO. So there is an opportunity to raise resources in those spaces only if we make a good case. Because if we don't make a good case, no one will know what we want. So we must know what we want. We must make a strong case. We must have strong conviction that this work is important. Then others are going to come in and invest. At the moment, the, G the, the uh, G7 was just having its meeting a few days ago. They have also consciously recognized the importance of WASH in healthcare facilities. So those are some of the main opportunities that are existing. I think for now, let me stop there. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. So, <clears throat> very, very concrete and 
Also, thank you for bringing out the importance of partner coordination behind a Ministry of Health-led strategy. Um, this has been an absolutely fantastic panel, I'm sure you'll all agree. I think we are just a little bit over time, but we'd like to take a, a few reflections from, from colleagues maybe from the floor. And I, I noted that uh, um, our colleague, Dr. Nedret, uh, Director of um, the Country Readiness Strengthening for Emergencies is here. And maybe, uh, Dr. Nedret, would you like to make a comment? Thank you very much, first of all, for organizing this important and critical event. And I cannot agree more with the panelists, both from WHO as... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do I go there, maybe? <laughs> Seeing everyone. So I cannot agree more on, on what you have been describing in terms of importance of WASH. And I would like to bring from an emergency perspective, I think at WHO you have heard that all this work is embedded actually to be able to provide the capacity at the primary health care, health facilities from bringing the infection prevention control together with the WASH is the, is the principle. But we're going one more step. I think what we have learned from Ebola multiple cholera outbreaks in Africa now is, is one of the highest at this point and it is incredibly difficult to be able to stop and uh, even though we have aggressive response measures we need to go one step further actually to the community level so we are talking even about the need for wash even at least if our, our priority is to protect the health workers we need to think of the wash also and, and the infection prevention control at the community level beyond the health facilities where we know a lot of exposure happens as there as well. And being prepared for any of the outbreaks is the, the work we do all together. So please count on us on this fight together. And we are aiming to save lives by working together. And I can also talk on behalf of the IFRC and UNICEF, where we are working very hand in hand, very closely together to bring all these services to the community level from an emergency, public health emergencies response perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nedret. Th thank you so much, Dr. Nedret. So, colleagues, it's a very rare opportunity to maybe uh, take a couple, just one or two, maybe one from this side and one from this side. Please, madam. Yes, uh, good evening all. I'm very grateful that I was invited, I think, by one of the panelists to attend this, uh, this panel, and I think it's wonderful. It's also very hands-on, and that's what I like. So I have a question, very practical question. I'm working with health facilities, as you say, in the middle of nowhere, where you stay overnight and you see what's really happening. Now we want to set up clean water supply for a little dispensary that has a very good rate of uh, maternal uh, survival. Uh, but how are we going to do it to avoid that what we heal above ground, we spoil underneath with poor wastewater management. So what we see is that rural dispensaries, very often, even if they improve the wash, facilities above ground, there is still, it's so difficult to have proper uh, filtration um, and it exists. I've been working with an, um, uh, a researcher in, from Burkina Faso and we have the filters, we have the possibility. Can you ministers and WHO sit together, give us a sort of package and say, that's the package you take, here you improve the wash above ground, here is your wastewater management to avoid you spread it underneath the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will, we will take that and we will uh, maybe just straight after this session we can find a way to connect on that because there's, I think there's lots of resources. So there's two interventions that I'd like to call on. One from the United Kingdom, please, and then a um, colleague from Nepal, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, good afternoon. My name is Aaron Jay, and I'm here representing the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office um, in the UK. And I'd just like to take the opportunity to 
um, highlight some of the ways in which the UK is championing WASH and healthcare facilities, building on the uh, previous panel, which was uh, extremely uh, illuminating. Um, the UK has been uh, a keen participant and supporter of the WASH and healthcare facilities task force, which you may already be aware of. And getting the basics right through strong primary healthcare must include prioritising WASH, and energy in all healthcare facilities. And we can only achieve this through health sector resourcing and leadership. We champion this agenda through the following. Currently, we support uh, data and monitoring through the WHO UNICEF Joint Monitoring Program, which publishes global updates, including on progress on WASH in healthcare facilities. And we also support the agenda through our bilateral programming, uh, such as our recently ended innovative hand hygiene partnership with Unilever, which is the Hygiene and Behaviour Change Coalition. And this supported 14,800 healthcare facilities with critical wash supplies and services. And we trained 400, 460,000 health and other key workers on hygiene practices in 37 low and middle income countries. And we also support this agenda through our core multilateral funding, including to the World Bank and to the WHO, which is the team I'm part of back in the UK, and also by integrating this into our approach to health system strengthening and ending preventable deaths of mothers, newborns and children campaign. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you so much for the invitation and also express my gratitude to the panellists today for your really insightful reflections and for sharing your lived experiences. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, if I may call on um, a colleague from Nepal, wanted to make a comment, please. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Dr. Bikas Tepkota. I work in the Ministry of Health um, in Nepal. Uh, I want to share how hygiene behavior change in integrated uh, which was integrated through vaccination program in Nepal. Um, with the help of water aid, we tried integrating hygiene behavior changes intervention into vaccination program targeting children and their uh, caretaker. The intervention targeted uh, six critical worse behaviors such as exclusive breastfeeding, hand washing with soap, food hygiene, feces management, water and milk treatment. Uh, later on, an independent evaluation was performed, which showed that the hygiene promotion intervention was effective in improving key hygiene behaviors, which I mentioned above, from 2% to 53%, uh, and contributed to increasing immunization coverage up to 12%. It is the unreached and strengthening of the capacity of frontline health workers. And it was also observed that period prevalence of diarrhea reduced to 5% from 15% between baseline and follow-up. So with uh, proven multiple benefits of the program, uh, we decided a policy decision to integrate program nationwide, and now it is running. So this, I think this offers a suitable model to deliver hygiene interventions and to reach most high risk and susceptible group multiple times. This particular example demonstrates how we utilize our ongoing health system delivery platform to promote WAS. So I would like to urge other countries and other agencies to try to bring those type of intervention in programs which we run uh, basically yearly uh, public health program so that we can collectively achieve universal uh, health coverage by 2030. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Colleagues, um, I've been given some strict instructions to move along now. So um, this has been a, a really important panel. I'm sure you will all agree that the, the perspectives from different angles on leadership could not have been more profound and uh, the task is now to actually activate and action some of those points that have been made. So with that, if I may um, just um, ask Dr. Lee, Assistant uh, Director General for Healthier Populations, to give us our closing remarks, please.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I'm doing right things, but a little bit in wrong timing. <laughs> it's a time to go home for your later dinner, so sorry for that. But uh, this is a very important I lesson a little bit here, and a lot of story, you know, I'm touched by a lot of story on the ground. And uh, I'm myself a healthcare worker as well. I visit many healthcare workers in my career development. So thank you, our dear moderator, and also thanks to all speakers. Thanks to Water Aid. Excellency ministers, dear colleagues and friends, it's my great pleasure to close this event as a really new Assistant Director General for the Healthier Population in WHO. So what we discuss today is a matter of human dignity and the human rights, rise to the health. Let's be very clear, high quality water and sanitation services save life, as many of you already mentioned. Yet, very sadly, about a million mothers and newborns died from related preventable costs every year. We have the tools, technologies, knowledge, resources to address the huge gaps that exist in this area. Yet, none of the least developed country is close to achieving universal basic services. This is the issue of equity. Globally, unbelievably, myself also feel really sad, half of healthcare facility lack very basic hand hygiene and, and other services. With water and the soup, including their toilets. I, I may tell you, I visited some rural healthcare workers in my career, there's no toilets. I couldn't find the toilets for myself when I visit. However, they need to continue providing care to 3.6 billion patients. This is about 45 of global population, a lot. Yes, we have a lot of reality on the ground, but we cannot accept this fact. Middle and high income countries also face, face challenges. Many of them have achieved basic services, but they face the urgent need to provide safer, climate resilient and sustainable services to prepare for, to prepare for and respond to growing emergencies, including climate change. Today, we heard a lot of stories and the reflection from many countries I cannot list here and also development partners, as they are taking action to strengthen washing healthcare facility, including many concrete activities. Most importantly, also how they are struggling to strengthen leadership and the political will. This effort, of course, need the data, need information to monitor progress and stimulate our further action. The WHO UNICEF online country check Checker, country checker, provides data from 73 countries across the eight practical steps that countries must take to sustain wash services and practice. Progress has been made in baseline data as well as updating and implementing health care waste and the washing standard, including with climate resilience focus. However, less than one in five countries have dedicated regular budget or are checking and using washing data within health information management system. So, what can we do in moving forward? WHO and the UNICEF will soon launch the Global Progress Report on wash and electricity in healthcare facilities. The report has three major recommendations. First, integrate wash, waste, and electricity services into health planning, programming, financing, and monitoring. Second, regu regularly monitor and review progress and strengthen 
accountability. And third, develop and empower the health workforce to deliver and maintain wash, waste, electricity services, and practice good hygiene. Let's collaborate, let's work together to make this recommendation a reality. WHO and the key partners like UNICEF and Water Aid have an important leadership role to play. Realizing this recommendation has a ripple effect. Improving wash, waste, and energy in healthcare facility will accelerate progress on all three of WHO triple billion targets. It will also boost booster achievement of SDG3, in particular UHC and maternal and newborn mortality. SDG6, as you all know, for water, C for water and sanitation. And SDG7 for affordable and clean energy. And SDG13 for climate action, where I just came from that event. We have a lot of work effort ahead of us. The global summit on wash, waste and electricity in healthcare facility in Jordan in June is an opportunity to strategize and share scalable approach among countries. And the newly approached UNSG resolution led by the group of friends on wash in healthcare facility provides an important accountability mechanism and instrument to engage cross sectors. There's no time to waste. Let's work smarter and harder to provide healthcare basics that will save millions of lives and fulfill a fundamental human right and needs. I thank you. Thank you very much. By the way, as, as WHO staff, I have uh, my colleague also here. It's pretty heavy feeling, you know, after so many years we are working on the improving health outcome of the people we are serving. But there are so many, many challenges that require a sense of urgency to take action. But I can easily understand, I'm fine on a country level work. So the, the reality at country level, in particular local level, they are facing so, so many challenges. So my big question is how we can do at the local level to based on the local context, have local innovative way that intervention, you know, are feasible. Because to me, feasibility is a bigger, big things. Implementation, implementation. I think I see the minister from us. <laughs> Tonga, right? Excellency, lot of reality in the small Pacific Island country as well. Thank you so much. Good luck with all of us. Let's working hard, but we need to have a dinner today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Better water, sanitation, and hygiene components in health services strengthen the resilience of a country's health system. If a health center does not have water hygiene and sanitation facilities. It will put both the health worker and the patient at risk of getting hospital-acquired infections. The risk of not having safe water, sanitation and hygiene in healthcare facilities is that pregnant women are denied uh, the right to access quality healthcare and also services of qualified healthcare workers as most of them will deliver from home because they don't want to go to the facility that does not have the proper services. Now, access to basic sanitation and safe water are restocking themselves for cleaning, especially during menstruation cycles. With more clean water, decent toilet, 
and good hygiene in the healthcare facilities, women, both as users and workers in the healthcare facility, become more vulnerable to infections and affect their ability to live and work in dignity. Government and health leaders should be accountable and continue to advocate to equity in water, sanitation and hygiene in healthcare facilities by being attentive to the needs and protecting women's dignity, safety and health.